Uh, on, in, in the study of the book of Hebrews, and uh, I trust that you remember that. We had a little bit of a hiatus the last couple of weeks as Faith and I have been away, but we've been looking at the uh, five. There are five warning passages in the, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, as I mentioned earlier, probably one of the hardest books to rightfully understand in our New Testament. Matthew might be one of those. The heart and center of Romans, it seems like so many People miss that, that the righteousness that comes as a gift by faith. Uh, but Hebrews, along with that, the book of Revelation. Now, in the, we're going in the coming fall, we're going to unfold the book of Revelations. It's just, God's really brought that to my mind, and I've been doing a study in it. But before we do that, we're going to look at this today. Today is the fourth of the five warning passages in the book of Hebrews and the uh, New Testament. And I, I've entitled it Warning Number Four. It's the Danger of apostasy. The danger of apostasy. When you think of the worst possible sin, you know, when you think of that, sometimes you think of the dirty dozen, right? <laughs> but when you think of the absolute worst possible sin, you know, and, and you were to be asked, what do you think that is? I think most people would have a short list, but that would probably include murder, for sure. They say, if you snuff out the life of someone who is an image bearer of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's certainly the worst of all sins. And those that do it to the, to the weak and to the smallest and, and to the unborn and, and certainly the masses, you think of someone like uh, Adolf Hitler or you think of someone like that, perhaps a ten, Ted Bundy in Florida and all that he did there in raping and killing and all that. So that's the worst. The, hell must have a special place for people that, that, that commit that kind of sin. And if you were to answer that, uh, as horrible as uh, the, uh, the, the sin of murder is, uh, it's not the worst sin. In fact, you, you know, of course, according to the Word of God, that the grace of God is able to reach even murderers and forgive them through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know that. You know, Moses was a murderer. Moshe killed uh, uh, that, uh, uh, for that Egyptian soldier. You remember that prior to all that? It was a murderer. And then what God did for David was looking forward to the cross. And then how about Saul of Tarsus? He consented to the murder of Stephen. At least he, he was part of that gang that put together this, this deacon in that early church. And uh, he calls himself the least, the greatest of all sinners. Uh, he was committed even by uh, conspiracy and working together uh, murder. But murder isn't the worst sin. It's forgivable. Aren't you glad that we may not feel like we want to forgive God in his grace and the mercy through the murdering of his own son is able to even forgive uh, the, the person who snuffs out the life of another, another image bearer of God. It's not the worst sin. Today, this, uh, this fourth warning is going to teach us that there is a sin that is beyond forgiveness. Some of you know it, and I've been asked as a pastor Remington, what about the unpardonable sin? Oh, pastor, I think I committed it. You know, oh, oh what have I done on that? And, uh, and so we're going to deal with the only sin that is beyond forgiveness today. And it's good for us to get a handle on it. And it's not the dirty dozen, and it's not murder, and so we shall see. Now, the writer of Hebrews uh, is, and I said this is like a sermon. I, I, I've written sermons for many, many decades now, and this feels like a sermon. And he is writing to Jewish believers, professed believers who are, are feeling the squeeze and the press and the persecution. They're suffering for being identified with Christ. And so he's presenting the preeminence of Jesus here. He's the, full, the promise of the Father, the one whom they were looking for as a Jew. And they have received him, or at least gave profession that they did. And while he's unfolding the, the wonder of Christ and the preeminence of Christ, he stops in these 13 chapters, uh, this sermon, if you will, and he, he addresses his immediate people with five of these warnings. Now, I remind you, to warn is to love. They do that all the time as a dad, right? All the time with my children. Do not go near the street. Was I being harsh? No. I didn't want my children run over by the truck or the car, right? So I warned them, stay back. As a child, we used to go to Niagara Falls 
And, and we go to the railing, that's no longer there. They moved it back and, and so on. A big chunk fell off and they had to redo something. But we get near the railing, you know, like kids, we don't know the danger. I like be hanging way over looking at Niagara Falls, going over. And my mother would almost have heart failure. She'd grab us by the collar and bring it. Get yes, I don't know, there's something about us. We want to come to the edge and go over, right? Warn, warn us to love. And, he, and, and that's what John does here through this writer. He's warning these ones, these professed believers. And, and we saw the first warning, it was a warning of drift. How shall we neglect the salvation? If, 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 how shall we escape if we neglect? Through what? Through drifting away. And there is a drift. And, and professed believers who are not truly saved, there's a drifting away from the wonder and the glory of Christ and his work and his church. There's a drifting. The second one was the doubting. So there are all these deeds. So the drifting, the second one was doubting. They doubted God's word, like the children of Israel in the world. And they all perished. Remember that? Don't doubt the word of God. Satan is a great doubter. He likes to put the temptation of doubt. He said to Adam and Eve, did God really say? And it, 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 it's not good to eat of that? And then he came to later and contrary doubting. The third warning involved dullness of heart. You know, it's amazing what sin will do. It causes us to have a dullness of heart where it gets less fuzzy. You see, truth and knives are just the opposite. You know, the more you lose, use a knife, think you want a nice knife set. We got a nice, nice set. She's always cutting up vegetables and all this. Finally, we got a little bit vested in this German cuttery. Oh, it makes it so much easier. But the more you use them, she was saying the other day, uh, I've got to get this sharpened. It's getting dull. A knife, the more you use, gets dull. Truth is the opposite. The more you use truth and, and wage yourself and study truth, the sharper you get. And these were ones who had professed Christ who were growing dull. They, had, they were not listening to the word. They were drawing away. They were forsaking the assembly. And, and they were getting dull and hard. And finally, the last is today, the party. The warning number four is the party from uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, oh my, the party. Well, there are in the, our passage today, I'm going to take your Bible if you have it, we're looking at the fourth warning passage, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to 39. And we're going to, it's a long passage, I'm going to read uh, excerpts of it as we look down through it. This warning uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, a, is one of the most serious and sobering warnings found in the entire Bible. God warns us today through the pen of this writer uh, in this occasion, and the warning and the danger is still true today. You see, there may be many in the company of the church, in our church family, and that know a lot about Jesus, and even identify with Jesus, and have, and but bit by bit by bit, because they're not true, genuine, personal possessors of the treasure of the gospel, they drift away and they're lost. And there's no forgiveness whatsoever. In fact, greater condemnation. It's, it's, if God didn't tell us in his word, we, we, would, we would be horror struck at the reality of this. And this passage is one of the most strict and severe warnings throughout the whole Bible of those of us maybe numbering in our church or in our churches or community. Oh, I know Jesus. Now, now let me tell you that there have been people who have told me that. Oh, I tried that. I tried Jesus once and they kind of wink at it and they're off in another direction. Or another one. I remember one, a man named Kurt. I don't know where he is. I haven't seen him many, many years. But he was a man who professed Christ, went to seminary, took his family, and then after that preached a little bit here and there and even filled a pulpit of mine once in Indiana. And then he said, I depart from the faith. I no longer believe it. That's horrifying. I mean, catch up with him. He tried. He avoided me, avoided me. I wanted to have lunch with him and warn him of the great danger. And he kind of snickled and snarled at it. And, oh, yes, I know all that. He peddled up to hear in truth. And his heart was still unconverted. Though he was numbered apart and had the high privilege of learning, he wandered away. He apostatized. He rejected the essence of Christ. And I prayed for his soul this morning as I thought about this. And, uh, and so on. 
And so let's look at this great warning here and, and see how God speaks to us today. It's chapter 10. It picks it up at verse 26, and it's through the end of the chapter. For the writer writes, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, that's the gospel, no sacrifice for sins is enough, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire, an underlying fire, that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who has rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has treated as unholy the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace, for we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes uh, you were publicly publicly exposed to insult and persecution. And other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not now throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what has what he has promised. For in a very short little while, he who is coming will come and not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, you will not be pleased with him. But uh, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who believe and are saved. But the best way to unfold this as I studied this passage the last few weeks, is to just ask four simple questions. We won't linger on them very long, but four questions that uh, unfold the serious, this most serious of warning of the danger of rejecting Jesus as Lord and Savior. This warning is the most serious, I underline it again, uh, 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 in my estimation, found in the entire Word of God. Well, let's ask, first of all, what is the nature and characteristic of apostasy. Apostasy is a word that has fallen out of use today. It used to be the church, the English speaking church, knew this word and spoke of it. We, we, how do we ever hear it? No, it's not the wife of an apostle, an apostasy. No, it isn't. It's no laughing matter, in fact. It, it means to reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. It means you fall away from a profession of faith that you made, yes, you made, and you fell away and leave and depart. That's what the word means. That, and so the, the, nature, the nature of apostasy is the intentional falling away, the defecting from Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. Now, it's one thing to defect, and sometimes we read about that in the United States, uh, CIA agents and some uh, soldiers defect, and they turn the coat, and then they join the enemy, right? And we go, like, what a horrible thing that is to defect. It's one thing to defect from your heart. The United States has a whole other matter to defect from the King of Glory, the Creator, our Redeemer. And, and that's what he's talking about, defecting it. All right? These are ones who, uh, who uh, have moved toward Christ. Uh, they had heard the gospel. They had been swept into maybe the music, the hour, the moment. Maybe, maybe they were uh, young children in a home. And, and I've often thought about this and prayed about that. And, and uh, as, uh, as I've seen parents uh, through the years, they send their children to Christian schools. And they learn all about the Bible. And they're in the church and the Sunday school. And they're up to hearing it. And, and we as parents want our children to be saved. Of course, right? It's hard to imagine living eternity without our children there with us. 
and, the, and the thinking of the result of that, right? So early on, we're nurturing them, developing. And we want them to pray a sort of sinner's prayer to be saved. And, 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 and that's right, and it's true. And we want to nurture that. Others help in that. But sometimes, just sometimes, and I know that it happens, that uh, there's a, a prayer that's uttered, and then mom says, I was there, you were four, five, six, and that becomes faith and faith. And what mom remembered, because they don't remember, and the details of the gospel and all of that uh, uh, really are not really genuinely personally owned. Although they appear, they're in Christian school, they're in Sunday school, they're in church, they're in our adult classes, they, they attend, and, 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 but bit by bit, and it may take years. It may take years. They, just kind of depart, wander away, willfully rejecting Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. That's, that's, that's what it is. It's the intentional falling away, defecting. And these are ones that, uh, uh, that Jesus talked about the parables, right? In, in Matthew 13, the Word of God falls on different types of soil. The soil are the different types of the heart. And one type is stony ground, right? It falls on it. It gives an immediate response to that. But in time, the cares of the world and, and all of that calls them away. No fruit and loss. And then the words of the Lord Jesus. These words, I remember memorizing these early in Matthew Chapter 7, verse 1. Not, Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there are some that just say, Lord, and seem to be at the forefront in, in leaders and saved in years. Not everyone is, but he who does the will of, of, of the Father. In other words, to personally own and possess the treasure of the gospel. I've said it before, it's to miss heaven by 12 inches. The old evangelist would say, you know a lot about Jesus and a lot about the Word, but you don't own Him as your own. Sometimes, uh, and I've said it through the years, and I know some groups and wanting to win children to Jesus, they use the phrase, ask Jesus into your heart. Ask Jesus into your heart. And they'll go to that, that Revelation 3.20. Behold, Jesus stands at the door and he's knocking, right? There, Jesus trying to get into a dead church. That's the church of Laodicea. That's the point of that. that. It is true that individually the Spirit calls and for us to be saved. And so young children would say, well, I pray for Jesus in my heart. What in the world does that mean? That's a very terrible expression of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And I'm a sinner and lost and under judgment. There are things that you must understand. And, we must, and, and so on. I, I just worry sometimes. It can fill the church with press believers who in time will indicate that they really are not saved. Their life gives very little evidence or no evidence. And that's who he's addressing here. Uh, those uh, that have been convicted of sin, those that, that were among Christians, those that even suffered, the text says, but the, begin, the things of God begin to wane and wane and wane, and it may take a long time for this to happen. Paul said that in the last days, I think we're in the last days, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 to 3, uh, many shall fall away, shall depart from Christ. I think we're in that. Creation was several thousand years before Christ and the flood around 2346 BC and we're 2,000 years on this side of it. If you go with biblical chronology at all and the way you look at the world, the system and all, the coming of Christ would be today or we are in the last days of the church. Many shall fall away from the faith. Well, that's the nature of it. In intentionally falling away, uh, leaving Jesus. What are the characteristics of it? Well, the characteristics are twofold. Jesus is known and recognized. He's known and he's recognized. At least in the head, not possessed and owned, but I know of Jesus, I know him. And for there are many uh, who are unsaved, who have never heard of him, but that's not an apostate. You see, every apostate, catch this now, one of the writers put this, I loved it, every apostate is an unbeliever. But not every unbeliever is an apostate. Now, that sounds like a trick, doesn't it? Every apostate is an unbeliever. Genius. He is not saved. But not every unbeliever is an apostate. What I mean, what I mean there are people around the world who have never heard the gospel. And so they've not rejected Christ per se. 
But there's still Romans 1 under judgment because what may be known of God is seen of God in the creation and they stand under judgment, right? Now God will mete out judgment and it will be accordingly, right? Those, But those who are unbelievers who peddle in the truth of the gospel, who circulate among the church, who are identified with the church and may have even suffered with the church, Right? Like these, they had suffered, identified with those that were identified with Jesus. They're unbelievers, is what he's saying. That's a sober thought. And so he is known and recognized, and yet the second character, he is rejected. Jesus is rejected. The apostate returns to, the text says, willfully sinning with no regard or interest in the Lord, the Lord's work, the Lord's people, or the Lord's way. That's the evidence of that. Now here's the thing. We cannot recognize apostates. You can't. You can't tell the difference between a Christian, a genuine Christian who is not living for Jesus. And that should never be, but that happens. We're still in the flesh. We're recovering sinners. That's sanctification of all of us. And don't pretend you can. I can't, you can't. That's why I said, it's so great if you're a genuine Christian and your eyes turn like chartreuse or some color. Oh, you're in and you're in and you're in. <laughs> right, right, right. But you never know, right? So you can't tell the difference between someone who is a genuine believer who has fallen into some willful sin and living you know, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Those, the Lord will either... <clears throat> Those, the Lord knows those that are his, he'll discipline and he'll cut their life short and take them home, sending unto death, remember that. Or he'll bring them back to that place of contrition, repentance, and, and they will again continue on openly serving the Lord, right? You can't tell the difference between that and an apostate, an unbeliever. You can't. Only the Lord knows those that are his and he'll sort that out. And today is the day of the wheat and the tares. You know, mixed among churches, godly churches, are genuine believers and those that, that appear to be, right, but are not, the tares. And God said at the final day, God will sort that out. And so the call is, be warned. If you've never trusted Jesus as your own Savior, you've peddled in truth up to here, raised in a Christian home, settle that issue today. Don't let another day go on. That's the warning here. To warn is to love. Oh, I would urge that upon everyone. I would do it for you if I could. I would do it for my children, my grandchildren. I'd do it for everyone. That they would be found in the day of judgment. To be found in Christos. In Jesus. Why should I let you into my... Because I'm in Christ. He died for all my sin. His righteousness is given to me as a gift. That's why. Welcome in. Abba, Father. Praise the Lord. Wow. Well, that's why the call is, and, and if you write down 2 Corinthians 13, Paul's writing to that church in Corinth, and he says what? To, to profess to the church there. He says, examine yourselves to see, in fact, whether that you're in the faith. Test yourself, he says, do you realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Examine yourself. We can only do that individually on our knees. Lord, if I'm, if I'm kidding myself, forgive me, Lord. Let me have new birth today. I receive you as my Lord, my Savior, my King. That's what he's saying there. Well, that's the nature and characteristic of apostasy. Second question, what are some of the common causes of apostasy? These are not new with me. You could come up with a list, things that, that, that influence uh, apostates uh, in their life and so on. Uh, ultimately, it's the willful, intentional unbelief. They just don't believe. They may conform on the outside, but on the inside, still lost. But beyond that, what are some things that, that, uh, that uh, common causes of it? Well, persecution is one. Persecution. What makes the church more pure and strengthens believers causes unbelievers, professors, to, to leave. And that's why persecution has a tremendous purifying effect upon the church. 
When it costs something to stand for Jesus, if you're not of a genuine salvation, then you're out of here. It's not a cultural thing. And we go down south and visit Sarah and Gray, and uh, there's, a, it's a, there's a lot of cultural Christianity. It's in, the, it's in the air. They talk. There's a gentleness and a grace there that we love, and we, we sense very different from in the northern states. But uh, oftentimes, they'll remind us it's a cultural Christianity. Those that know the language of Zion and speak about these things, it's they're just a culture. It doesn't mean they're genuine believers in Jesus. In, in the South, my daughter said, we go to football, high school football on Friday, and we go to university football on Saturday, and on Sunday, everybody goes to church. I mean, that's, that's the South down there. And so it's, it's hard to tell. It's even harder to tell, right? But persecution has a way when it costs something to stand. If you're not a genuine believer and Christ isn't in your heart through the Spirit of God, then I'm out of here. Right? So it's a wonderful thing. The words are cheap. We used to hear that, right? Words are cheap. I like to see the evidence of that. One man wrote, I put it in a quote, I think, and he put it that way. Words are cheap. Persecution is not. <laughs> And that, that's right. If it costs something to stand, then I'm out of here, right? Persecution. How about false teachers? Boy, we have them everywhere. Oh, my. Those that tickle my ears, tell people what they want to hear. You know, most churches, I'm just guessing, wouldn't be able to stomach a message like this. This loving, severe warning of heaven and hell and suffering and judgment. Warning to be gentle. Why? Oh, that's, oh, you can't tell people that. You gotta love them and that kind of nonsense. And it's true. It's true. We need to love them to Jesus. No question. Not. But the truth of God's word, all scripture is profitable and needs to teach all the, the whole counsel of God. False teachers entice unbelievers away from the true gospel. How about temptation? Temptation's a third thing that, that the things the things of the world become more attractive than the things of God. That's again that Matthew 13 where the, the seed of the gospel falls upon a heart that's stony ground and that cares the things of the world just woo and call and, and, and take us away. There's no fruit, loss, temptation. Temptation. Oh, we live in a world of that. If you're not daily as a, uh, on your knees in the morning and seeking the Lord and enjoying that time and finding strength in His Word, you're just hanging out there. Oh my, it's like my old piano teacher used to say. One, uh, one day you miss practice, you know. Two days, guess what? I know. Three days, the world knows. That's not far off from our walk of the world day by day. Why? Because there are voices that fall, and clamor, in the media, TV, all these things. You don't have all this stuff and all this excitement. All that we look at my life like. Life's a zero compared to that. I, I, and you're tempted to wander away. Oh, this world is fraught. Satan knows our weakness. He knows. And uh, that can call people away. A fourth is neglect. This might be the most insidious. Just delay. So you hear the gospel and, and you're just like, well, I just need a little more truth and maybe another day and manana and, and maybe just neglecting to act upon what you know and receive Christ today as Savior. Neglecting that most important, the Spirit of God draws you near, there's a conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and you go like, ah, maybe another time I'll do that. You have to be careful about it. You know the example, the other reason why, is the opportunity for salvation and it may no longer be there. No longer be there. I grew up in a home. My parents had two other families. They grew up in large families. Ours was we had seven children, a second of seven. And there were two other families that the dad and mom were close to. They had, one had seven, and one I think had six children. When they got together, it was, a, it was crazy, right? And uh, I remember one day, my, my, my mother, was talking to one of the couples and their kids here at the house, and she said to Laverne, his name is Laverne, Laverne, when are you going to get your children to Sunday school? I remember her asking that very directly with my mother's little finger, you know. <laughs> oh my goodness. And he said, I'll, I'll be dead before they're in Sunday school. I went, holy cow. 
And as we have to underline that, God is my witness. Within one week, he was dead. 42 years old. Did I lose my speaker? Yeah. I don't know if I lost the battery or not. Yeah, within uh, you can check that right. Within no, it's not. Okay. within uh, one week he was dead. And I'll never forget the. It was so sad. And you know, the following week, you can imagine, right? His children were in our Sunday school. I don't know what God has done in their hearts and life. I've lost track of them, but God is not mine. He is not mine. And so on. And, uh, and so neglect. The day of opportunity passes. Thank you, Raj, for that. The last thing is forsaking the Christian fellowship. And that's the text here. Don't forsake the assembly of yourself, as is the manner of some. And with this virus and everything on, and folks scattered, it makes me, as a shepherd, under shepherd, as an elder with our elders and deacons, makes me nervous about folks in the periphery. They're not gathering together and finding courage and gathering on the first day and, and, and hearing the word and singing and giving and praying. To There's a refining and encouraging process that goes on as we encourage one another as the day approaches. And neglecting that. Well, just take a vacation from church. A vacation. Obviously, that's a common cause of apostasy. Well, what does the text say in verse 26 and following? What are the results of apostasy? Well, the first one, there remains no other sacrifice for sin. I mean, Jesus is it. There is no wandering away to some other ism or schism or some other thing. There isn't. It's the end of the road. It is Jesus. That's it. The one who created, the one who was foretold, the seed of the woman, all the way through, the promised one who came, whom the angels uh, rang in the heavens of God, was born in Bethlehem. It is only the Lord Jesus. Jesus said something to Peter one day, will you go to? Well, to whom shall we go? You're the one that has the words of life. It's Jesus. And so to leave Jesus, to willfully neglect and reject him, is to uh, be at the end of the road, and there is no other uh, hope that is possible. It's beyond reach. Only the, the foreboding thought of suffering forever for sins in a place called the lake of fire in hell. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 clearly teaches that. It's really the words are somber, similar to these. Second Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with an everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. What somber words. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. There is no hope beyond Jesus. It's not Jesus and me. It's not Jesus and Buddha. It's not Jesus and my education. It's not Jesus and my... It's not any of these things. And you're not God. We're made in the image of God, creatures of God, holy needing a Savior. He is the be-all, end-all, and to leave Him is to leave everything. That's the result. And the second thing is, this willful rejection of Jesus will bring greater judgment. He's the end of the road. There's nothing else. And it brings greater judgment if that were not a knot. Enough. Verse 29 says a raging fire will consume. We read that. The principle here is the greater the sin, the greater the judgment. The greater the sin, the greater the judgment. Apostasy is the greatest sin possible. It's to know Jesus, know of Jesus, but not own him as your Savior. Oh, I wish that you would today. Because the judgment is more severe. In greater light, greater judgment. There will be degrees of punishment in the lake of fire as God meets out justice and judgment in the days to come. Acts, Paul said there in Acts 17 in Athens, verse 31, For God has set a day when he will judge the world by, with justice by the man whom he appointed. That's Jesus. There's a judgment come. I know the world hates that thought. We like to feel like we got away scot-free. There's a judgment coming. 
Or if not, there's no difference between evil and good. It's all the same. It really doesn't matter. There's a judgment coming. There's a judgment coming, and we sit with our eyes wide open. We can't say, well, I never heard the name Jesus. Oh, we may have served, may have filled pulpits, may have been there, but we never owned him as our personal Lord and Savior. That's the warning, the loving warning of this. Oh, come over. Come over and be saved. And genuinely love and know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Oh, my. Well, if that's the result, no other sacrifice, greater judgment. And finally, and last, and last, what, what can provide any deterrence to apostasy? Are there any? Well, the writer, the writer ends up with a very positive note. He's assuming that those that hear this, he knows them, and they're going to make this decision for Jesus Christ their own. And they're going to come over. He's persuaded of better things of those who numbered in the group, who professed Jesus but didn't really own him, that they would call upon his name. For whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. And so to deterrence, to help in that, first of all, he says, remember, remember. Verse 32, remember those earlier days. They were numbered with a group that were genuine believers. They are identified and they suffered. Remember, you suffered all those with real believers. You were identified as one of them. You lost your property. You were thrown in jail. You, you, you received the verbal assaults and all of that. Now, move on to Jesus or all that's for naught. That's kind of the expression. What was that if you die and perish forever? Remember all of that and receive Christ as your Savior and receive, second, and not only remember, he says, look forward to the reward that he has. And persevere in this, for God will reward you for what you have done and promised and uh, so look forward. So it's look back. Remember what you suffered. Verse 35 through 36. Look forward to your rewards. And he ends positively saying, I know that many of you will do that. Would to God that everyone that would hear my voice today on the broadcast and in our auditorium here will settle this all important question as we examine our own heart to make sure that we're found within, that we're not part of Jesus, as Matthew said, that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. Lord, let that not be me. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, what he's saying here is, finally, the, the warning, the worst possible sin. It's not murder, it's not rape, it's not what Hitler did. As horrible as all of that, but the worst possible sin that's unforgivable is to know Christ and to reject him as Lord and Savior. Oh, I would say, don't let that be you. Oh, I would pray for you, with you, on your behalf. Oh, don't let that be you. It's a loving warning. More than my mother's warning at Niagara Falls, more than many of Faithy's warnings to our children when they were little, you know, all of that. This has eternal consequences. Oh, today, receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Don't reject Him. Make Him your own. Examine your own heart. Remember the words of John who said, remember they went out from us because they were not of us. Oh, may all of us here be genuine believers in Christ. Oh, I pray. Shall we pray? Father, thank you so much for this warning. It's so, it's sober, Lord. But we're dealing with things of eternality, Lord, forever. To be with Jesus because of the cross. Each one of us, Lord, may each one of us, even right now, that you're my boys. Do what Paul said. Let's each one examine our heart. Lest we be self-deceived. To be like Judas, Lord. Oh, to be like Judas who lived three years with the Lord. Oh, did he know you? And then at a point in time, he, he rejected you. And Lord, I pray that we might not be that in our own heart. We have known so much of the truth. Apostates come from the church that, that knows and preaches and teaches of Jesus. Lord, may that not be young. Save us from that, Lord. Each one, even now, far away, or maybe watching, listening, those in the audience, may we 
today put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Thank you for all our sin to your cross. Your righteousness is a gift to us. We love you so much.